like I'm getting an EKG or something. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess we'll get started. I'm only four minutes late. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Andy Watson, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about building web apps in Go. Um, my background uh, was for, for, uh, for, I don't know, 13, 14 years I wrote PHP. I started that a long time ago, and I built a lot of crazy different stuff. And um, so my, my first job actually was in college. I was a system administrator for the, the physics department. I just like this picture because it's, that thing's the size of like a house. It's a Van de Graaff generator at the end of the accelerator. And it used to fire these beams. And the code that I was sort of managing and running on these systems was interpreting these streams of information that came out when the beams would collide at the end of this long loop. Um, so some of this is just sort of like to let you know how old I am, so you'll sort of, so at least some, uh, cr it gives me some credibility. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I started out, you know, in the 90s doing a lot of pro CGI stuff for credit union websites and whatnot before you could actually do anything useful on their website. You know, just they didn't have online banking and stuff like that. Uh, and server side includes and all the stuff that, you know, a lot of my younger coworkers have never heard of. Uh, and then around 2001, I uh, did my first PHP uh, for our company because we were having a lot of trouble with uh, templating and, and managing this large cumbersome website with Perl CGI and stuff like that. Uh, so I've done PHP for uh, little tiny companies, for great big companies, worked on DisneyWorld.com recently, uh, built a logistics application for a shipping terminal in Long Beach. Um, built speedtv.com twice, uh, uh, stuff like that. So I've done, been doing PHP for a long time, and I've done lots of different flavors of it, used lots of different frameworks, uh, and built a lot of the kind of things. Um, I found this in the web archive. It didn't render very well because it was designed for Netscape 4. Um, but that was the first website. That was sort of where I first started doing PHP. Um, there were lots of crazy little includes because of the navigation had to be the same on every page, and it was a mess. But uh, when it was all pro CGI, it was really hard to manage. So PHP made it a lot easier. So PHP was great. Lots of people knew uh, how to use it. It was you could run it on almost everything. Um, everybody was running PHP three, so there was no issue of like what kind of what version of PHP is it running because it was so so old. Um, you know, and and it had libraries for lots of different things, databases, and um, you know, connectivity things and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> it just didn't have this concurrency uh, concept, right? So um, when I was at Disney, we realized that while we were doing development on this massive website that got tons of traffic and huge surges of activity, right, when everybody got their Christmas bonus and things like that, that uh, the PHP app was trying to log everything that was happening out to disk. And so we were running an Apache and when there were 100 child processes or 200 child processes, and they all called log at the same time, uh, it actually tried to log into the same file, all 100 of them, and all but one of them would create a fatal exception because of the way Zen framework worked at the time. And so I thought, this is nuts, right? This is <laughs> crazy. So all these processes are waiting to give HTML and stuff back to the guests so they can continue buying tickets or whatever. But they're waiting for this logging operation and they can't do anything asynchronously they can't do like make sure this happens but like continue doing this right they were just like wait for this uh, file to be open and so uh, the Java developers who built the middleware for DisneyWorld.com said to me like well sh you just log it asynchronously right and I was like no that's not a thing <laughs> and they're just like, what? what do you mean it's not a thing? Like, that's cr crazy. Like, in the, they showed me, like, oh, here in the Java, in the Tomcat app, we just add this one um, annotation. And it's just like, oh, yeah, that just happens asynchronously. And, and, you know, if something doesn't work, like, we get this callback thing. And I was like, oh, that's that's great. So, <laughs> uh, so there's lots of workarounds to doing stuff asynchronously in PHP. And so I did some research on sort of the, the ways people have gotten around this in the past. And um, I've done a lot of these, actually. Uh, the writing to sockets thing seems to be popular. I actually built an experimental log writer at Disney that streams stuff out over TCP and UDP. And then I had to create a process in a language that actually could do threading and, and concurrent activity to process the logs and, and whatnot. And I felt like that was kind of a dirty hack. I felt like kind of 
like I'd given up uh, <laughs> and it didn't work and it was really buggy and especially the UDP side because if the PHP generated the stack trace then it was UDP so you'd get like the middle third of the stack trace first and uh, it was impossible to read so uh, so we tried stuff like um, uh, logging stuff out to files and then having something else that actually could do things concurrently process the log file it felt like I was quitting again you know <laughs> not getting PHP to do it like I wanted to uh, actually did a lot of stuff with RabbitMQ and sort of firing stuff off into uh, into the uh, the uh, AMQP exchange to saying like just make sure this happens right but the problem with that is well, the problem with all these approaches is the main thread of execution in the PHP can't say oh wow one of those things that I fired off 37 milliseconds ago failed right it's already gone it just fired off the message and keeps on going and um, it has no idea that this other thing didn't work it can't respond to the the, the guest or the user, I call them guests because the Disney World beats it into your head, but um, you know, you can't say do these five things simultaneously or concurrently and then if you know, as soon as three of them are done, kill the other two. Like there's no concept to that. There's there's lib event and things like that, which is sort of Rasmus's answer for asynchronous activity. But it was all kind of crap. And so, you know, it started making me wonder when people talk about concurrency these, this way, you know, if they even know what it is. So I looked it up and it has a definition and um, you know potentially interacting with each other is really the key thing for me because it's one thing to say we can do these two things at the same time. It's another thing to say both of those things can still affect each other's execution uh, or the execution of some other third thing, right? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I get ahead of myself all the time. So. <laughs> so I've, when I discovered Go uh, a while ago, uh, late 2000, I don't, I think it was early, late, early 2014. I can't remember. Sure. I tried to go back and look at my code, and it's, uh, it's too much of it, so I couldn't tell when. But um, you know, at my company, we had started to talk about taking this sort of proof of concept monolithic PHP application and break it into a service-oriented architecture. And before it had been all PHP website and uh, for things that were uh, long running or processes that took a while, like reaching out to Amazon SCS to send an email, we would fire that into RabbitMQ and then just assume the PHP would just assume you know, it would say check your email and cross its fingers and hope that you got the email <laughs> and hope that the message got picked up by some other process and and processed correctly. And I, that never sat right with me. And so we had like other cues, like if errors would come back and I was like, it's too complicated. It's just, but you know, if you already, if you already told the president to check their email, it's, that ship has sailed, right? So, uh, so I started building services in Go and at first we thought, well, maybe we'll build one or two things in Go, you know, and the rest will still be PHP or Python or whatever, you know. But as we started using Go, we started building everything in Go, and the next thing you know, it's it's already in Go. So um, you know, it gives you some great uh, primitive things to support concurrent activity. <clears throat> and the mantra, well, I'm getting ahead of myself again. That's on the next slide. Um, the idea with Go is that you create uh, channels where messages are passed back and forth between concurrent routines. And in that way, you can create all the same uh, control structures you would create with like a multi-threaded application, like with semaphores and weight locks and things like that. But you can create the same thing with these primitive channel types. Um, <clears throat> and so instead of actually having to worry about two different threads modifying the same memory space, you actually have to pass that data from thread to thread for it to be available to it. And so... Um, ah. Never mind, it's not on this slide. So the idea is to, you know, the run uh, routine in a separate co Go routine is you just put Go in front of it. And so this is a very simplistic example because it will run in a separate Go routine. And the Go routines are multiplexed into threads uh, or uh, processes, depending on the underlying operating system. But the Go runtime takes care of all that detail for you. So as a developer, you don't have to worry about, is it P threads? Is it hyper-threaded CPU, you know, all those things, it just happens, right? And so, um, so then, so they created this idea of channels. And channels are really, it's a primitive type in the standard go around time. And channels are defined by the type of data that you can expect to put into it and get out of it. And so you see here, 
is inside that function. So you say go func and then you run the function. So it's in a go it's in a go routine by itself and then do something for a while gets called immediately after that in the prime in the first go routine. And as soon as list that sort is done, that one gets sent into the channel. And then at the very bottom you see it's waiting for something to come out of the channel. So it's going to block, the main thread is going to block until that one comes in from the channel. So it's a signaling mechanism. And uh, there's ways to structure it so that you could actually say inside of the, the function there's another channel that's waiting for input on as well. So from the outside you can say actually forget it, cancel it, and send a message in so it can stop doing what it's doing. So it's a very powerful construct. Uh, they can be either buffered or unbuffered. By default, they're unbuffered. So uh, one thing in, um, if you're waiting for something to come into a channel, or if you try to write into a channel and nobody's listening, that it'll, it'll block until somebody's listening for something off that channel. So it's a very good control mechanism. Um, buffered channels, you have to allocate the size of the buffer in advance, and it can make it a little hard to debug exactly what's going on in an application because some you can write into a channel as long as there's space in the buffer. And it's a good way to kind of create back pressure inside of a service-oriented architecture to say, I'll only ever allow this many requests to be sort of waiting to be processed, and the, new, the other ones just block or I just reject them. Um, <clears throat> and so, oh yeah, and you can, oh, there it is. So this is the mantra behind Go concurrency. Um, you know, do not communicate by sharing memory. Share memory by communicating, right? So instead of having to worry about putting semaphores around certain um, certain variables or certain memory spaces and, and locking things and things like that, you just pass the data around between routines, and it's much more powerful. Uh, there's some great talks about concurrency in Go. They go into a lot more detail. They were given by Rob Pike and, and the other guy, and Andrew Jen, uh, and the rest of the Gopher team at Google. They're really good. They gave these talks at uh, a lot of conferences, including uh, Google I.O. one year. So, so web apps in Go. So web apps in Go actually make a lot of sense to me because it's a very powerful language. It supports the idea of concurrent activity. Uh, it's a very simple language. It's easy to write. It's easy to understand. When you compile the Go code, it produces a static binary that you just run and it's self-contained so you don't have to you don't have to have some other architecture or some other environment to run it in like you know nginx and fpm or apache or iis or you know something else it's a completely standalone binary so that standalone binary can do other things besides via web server which means embedding a web server inside of something else is really easy as well so here's a simple a simple web app that basically just responds with hello world. And uh, so it has this uh, listen and serve, which says what address to listen on. And it has a handling function that gets these writers and responses, which is a fairly common pattern uh, in a lot of languages. And then I uh, went through the trouble of preparing this little video of it running. I think it'll work. Yep. It's not much to look at, and but you just do go run main.go and it says I'm listening and you do a curl and it says hello world and uh, so it's pretty straightforward. The go compiles very fast. It produces a, a static binary so you can be up and running pretty fast. So of course with, this, with any web application you don't want to be echoing out long strings of uh, content. You don't want the HTML, CSS, and things like that to be in your Go code. You want it to be separately in other files and things like that. So uh, the Go standard library has a templating uh, package. And it's very flexible and very powerful. And it has a, uh, a version of that for HTML that actually helps you do a lot of uh, prevention of uh, server-side uh, SQL injection and, and cross-site scripting problems, things like that. It's, it helps you with scrubbing data out as you render it out. It also has the idea of nesting templates inside of each other, which comes in, which makes it very powerful. So it is a simple template where, in this case, the template's actually stored in this literal string in the Go application, but that's just to make it sort of fit on the slide uh, because the templates actually can be external files and you can actually tell the template uh, library to 
parse all the templates in this directory, and then when you and then refer to them by name, and so you can say parse all of them, and then render that one, and then render that one. So if they're if they're if you're using partials and you're going to refer to them by name, you don't have to say which ones to parse every time, things like that. So in this case, you know you have the simple HTML structure, and in the middle you have the curly brackets with a dot, and so what that that's where the interpolation happens from the data that gets passed to the template execution. And so the dot is always the current structure at the top. If you were going to range over a list, which we'll show in a second, or pick out a certain element uh, to do an operation on, the dot would refer to like where you were in the structure. Um, so here's some simple logic. So instead of having to write code, go code that says, use this template if there's something in the structure, else use this other template that says there's nothing in the structure, or having to write um, complicated code in the template is just an if statement. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, then what you have is the ability to iterate over things. And so there's some, uh, some Go snippets that show a book structure that has uh, author and title string. And then you have a Go variable that's a slice of books. Um, the, the square brackets is not an array, it's a slice. And a slice is a special type that's sort of like an array, but it actually has references to the current size of the array and other things internal inside of it. So it does a lot of magical things for you. And so in this example, it's creating a variable that's a slice of books and then assigning it a value based on some function called lookup books for sale and then executing the template. And what you have is you have this range operator. And so it automatically ranges over the things in the list. Or if it has nothing in it, if it's empty, it does the else clause for you. So there's no, if the count of the slice is zero, then do this. There's none of that. It just does that for you automatically. And so what you get is this output, you know, um, automatically. It's, it's just a lot less code to write. <clears throat> so what you saw in the very first simple web server was this handler function that takes a response writer and request um, structure. And then, you know, if you were going to say, there's, there's a lot of cases, you know, in a PHP app where you have, if the request is a post, do this, um, things like that. So you'll, you'll, you'll see the same thing in here. And what you'll end up seeing is a lot of duplicate code, a lot of the same thing over and over again. Um, if it's a post, if it's a get, if it's a put, uh, delete, you know, if the content type header is XML, over and over again, right? So what you end up needing is a routing library. So with the, with the HTTP router, which is a great uh, example and a very fast one, you see that you can just say, uh, a post to this URL goes to this this handler instead of having to check in the handler of all these variables. It also allows it a route based on all kinds of other variables like the session ID, uh, the presence of certain headers, and things like that. So you can say if it's a post to the login URL and there's no header that says bearer token, then go to this page, you know, stuff like that. Then, you know, maybe take them to the create account page. You know, there's some interesting stuff like that. Um, so you can learn more about HP Router there. I meant to shorten that one like the other ones, but I, I forgot. Uh, so then the other thing you need with a web application is middleware because there's a lot of duplicate boilerplate code around. Make sure this request gets logged. Make sure the we log that it's been received and make sure we log that it's been responded to, make sure we log how long it took, make sure we uh, captured the conversation ID, the other headers, uh, make sure we capture any errors that happen, things like that. Uh, make sure we automatically add the right headers to match the content type on the way out, things like that. And so it's, instead of having every handler function have to do all that itself, then you can use a middleware to do that. So a really good one is called Negroni. And, um, but there's, there's a lot of them. And some, um, some routing libraries slash frameworks provide some of this stuff on their own as well. But uh, I'm a fan of sort of mixing and matching and not going whole hog on one sort of set of things because I found certain things that work better than others. <clears throat> uh, another package is really great called Render which sort of takes away some of the boilerplate around templates because if you have a template and you, all your handler functions are saying execute this template, uh, execute that template, or if an error happened, then do this, right? So render helps you uh, sort of take out, 
you know, the bulk of that boilerplate code that you see in every handler function again and say, render this structure as JSON, done. You know, it takes care of the headers and all this other stuff for you. So it's a really great thing. Um, another thing you need is a context. So if you're going to accept a request into your web server or web service and it's going to have certain headers, authorization headers, etc., and then you're going to turn around and make service calls to other services to say, hey, give me the first name of the user with this ID and give me the uh, the favorite color of the user with this ID. Uh, you want to pass a lot of that contextual information along to those services so when they log the fact that they got a request, they can tie, you can tie those two requests together so you can trace the execution of the program. And so a context is really great for that because then instead of having uh, you know, 17 different things that you have to turn on and pass to every handler along the stack and the middleware and whatnot. And then you add an 18th one, you got to go through all the code and add the 18th one. You just slap it in the context object, which gets passed around. The context is also good for shared act, shared things like database connections or, or configuration information. So that uh, the very first thing can sort of create this context and say, like, this is what we're operating under, here's the connection to the database or to the Google OAuth token or whatever it is, and then everybody else just sort of takes it and runs with that. Uh, so context is great. And the Gorilla Toolkit context is one of the best. Uh, Gorilla Toolkit also makes uh, an, a router called MUX, which is very powerful. Uh, it's not quite as fast as HTTP router, so I sort of switched to HTTP router at the moment. They also make a lot of other stuff about session management for web apps and stuff like that, so Gorilla Toolkit's pretty great. So you, you, you hit save in Sublime Text and it modifies your .go files. Uh, so now you alt-tab over to the terminal and you have to hit control C to stop your server. You have to up arrow a couple times to get to the go build command, so you do that. You build it again, then you have to run it again. Now you go to Chrome, and you know, every time you change one line of code, you're doing this whole cycle over and over again. So it's kind of great to have a way to automate that process. And so there's this program called Jin, which will automatically, it wraps a proxy around your application. And if you hit save in Sublime Text or whatever you're using to edit your code, it sees like, oh, the Go file has been changed. All right, let me recompile it and restart the process. And so it does that for you automatically, and it speeds things up dramatically. It also can um, can capture the output from your process and uh, help you log it and things like that. It's really great for development. Uh, so once you've got that and you've got a working application, then it's time to go to production. So the great thing about Go is that it's a compiled static binary, but it comes built in with cross compilation tools. So from my Mac laptop, well, this isn't a Mac, but uh, normally from a Mac laptop, you know, I can I can compile a Linux binary for x86 or ARM or AMD. I can compile a Windows binary. I can compile uh, different versions of Dar you know Darwin. I can compile. I think there's about 12 or 14 different platforms I can actually compile a Go program for for many of those 14 platforms, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so you compile it for whatever platform you're going to ship it on and you SCP it to production and then you run it. And then, you know, it's a standalone process, so you've got to maybe create an upstart script or uh, something for systemd to process in order to know, like, oh, if it dies, I should restart it. These are the arguments to pass to it, things like that. Um, so that, but that's all, that's all sort of standard stuff. An alternative to that would be to actually deploy it to Google App Engine. And this is something I started doing recently. I didn't used to like Google App Engine. Uh, when it first launched, uh, which was, I don't know, like five or six years ago now, it seems like uh, yesterday. Uh, it was only Python. It is a very specific version of Python. Uh, it was buggy. It was down for days at a time. <laughs> and there was no phone number to call. There was no way to pay them to keep it running. It was an experimental thing. And so uh, a friend of mine had a startup, and they had built the whole thing on Python and deployed it to App Engine. And then it was out for a day. And I said, what are you going to do? He's like, I don't know. Just wait till it comes back, I guess. So I was like, hmm, lesson learned. I'm not going to play there for a while. But it's evolved quite a bit since then, and you actually can actually need to pay money for it now uh, for certain things. So uh, I get a bill for about $2 a month right now for the site that nobody ever hits. Um, so what the great thing about App Engine is they've added support for new runtimes. So they have a, a Java and a Go runtime. I swear they had a Ruby runtime, but I think they turned it off. 
uh, but it doesn't matter because I only write Go now anyway. Um, so you can build your Go application the same way you would otherwise, except for a few small modifications, and deploy it to App Engine. And the great thing about it is, is they have this incredible data store behind it that you can access with uh, some simple Go libraries that they provide to you. So you take a structure like that book structure, and you just say, save it. <laughs> and it gives you back a key, which is like this long key. Uh, and then you just say like, great, oh, let me update that record. You know, you just change the structure and say like, save this thing with this key. And it's highly available. It's consistent across multiple data centers automatically. Uh, it's really great. Um, they're working on a plan to actually just let you, well, this is in beta now, to take the App Engine instance, which puts some restrictions on you as far as writing to the FOSS system, and with a command, convert it to a managed VM, which you can actually SSH into. And then that Go program can do whatever it needs to do, uh, local FOSS system, uh, network activity, things like that. And you can run uh, multiples of those. Uh, so it's it's a really great, great platform. They're tying it into some of the Google container engine stuff they're doing so that you can actually, and well, that's actually how it works in App Engine. It actually is running it in a container without uh, making you deal with the complexity of that. Um, so it's really great. It's a really great way to, to get a simple web app up and running uh, without any server infrastructure of your own. Um, Another thing I'm looking at working on is some of the newer stuff with Google's, I mean, Amazon's Lambda and the API gateway, because there's ways to run Go apps in Lambda, because it's a Linux box, so you just cross compile it for a certain, uh, for their architecture, and you zip it up with a little JavaScript that says, like, run that thing, and you just upload it to Lambda, and it runs your JavaScript, which runs your Go program. <laughs> Uh, so that's kind of neat too. You can build a fully fledged API using the API gateway in, in Amazon Lambda. Um, so there's some other resources. I created these Bitly links uh, for things. There's some great talks on the um, the, the Golang Talks website, which is talks.golang.org, about concurrency and other things. And then the Google Cloud Platform has a whole section now on Go. It's no longer this weird stepchild. Um, they have a whole site about getting started with example applications you can download and, and, and get started with. That's really great. And um, well, that's it. So I know I didn't cover everything. There's a lot to cover with web app development. And we could have gone into data abstraction. There's great packages for sort of abstracting away the details between MySQL and Postgres and things like that. Uh, but I felt like if this is the first time you've ever seen Go, like I didn't want to go too deep too fast and it'll lose everybody. So if there's any questions. What's the sort of speed comparison to uh, something written in Python? Oh, uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, generally, because the Go app is a compiled static binary, it's it's hundreds or thousands of times faster than you know this interpreted Python stuff um, because it's actually executing a similar, you know, a machine code. Uh, I found that we've built services at our, at our company in Go that handle orders of magnitude more traffic than the stuff that's written in Python. So, so if I had to pan the database query, for the pan service, mm -hmm. a real comment. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think we found that basically wherever we have uh, Go applications that have to rely on something else, whether it's a relational database or another service, it's always the other thing that's slowing it down. <laughs> uh, and there's, and there's, you know, Go is garbage collected, uh, so you don't have to manage memory yourself. And so there is a garbage collection penalty you pay. And so in Go versions up to 1.4, there was there were events people experienced in production where it sort of stops the world to do garbage collection and stuff. But in 1.5, which came out in August, it's much better at doing that in closer to real time. And so it's able to mark things uh, as black and, and, and gray and, and clean them up more easily because of reference counts and things like that. So. I 
I've never experienced too much of a slowdown. I guess theoretically it could. Uh, the great thing about App Engine 2, and I didn't mention this before, is they have a memcache support built into it as well. And so instead of having to say, uh, spin up a new instance running memcache and like here's its IP and port and how I authenticate to it, in your Go program you just say like, oh yeah, store this in memcache. <laughs> and uh, when you're testing locally, the Google Cloud Platform runs on your laptop and has all the right structures internally. So it runs the same on your laptop as it does in production. You don't have to modify anything to ship it to production. And so you can say, like, frequently access things. Yeah, we don't want to go back to uh, the data store to get, so we'll just store them in memcache, things like that. Say that, say that one part again. When you're running, when you want to develop code for Google Apps, yeah, they give you a, a tool. Yeah, there's a tool that you download that comes with that's part of their development package, and you run G Cloud um, Serve. Or they change it around. It used to be App Serve. Anyway, it's it's changed uh, terminology a little bit, but yeah, you run it locally, and then it has a data storage and and all these in the memcache APIs and all this, and then the ability to OAuth you against a Google account. Everything is the same as it is in production. It's just running on your laptop for speed reasons, and it does the thing Jin does, where as soon as you hit save in your editor, it detects the change in the code and recompiles and restarts it for you automatically as well. Uh, it also um, helps you create indexes on your data store objects. As you're running it in development mode, it's looking at the queries your application actually does and generates these index hints in a file. When you upload it to Google App Engine in production, it uses those hints. And so you can train it. Instead of having to define the indexes yourself and guess what gets used the most often in your, in your application, it actually figures it out for you. So that's, that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I like about using PHP is that the community is so large and there's plenty of mm -hmm. you know, frameworks and libraries. And sure, sure. And pretty much everything you need. If you're running to a problem, it's already been answered by time. Right, right. Would Go being a little newer and everything, how does that compare? How was the transition? It's pretty good. The community is growing. At first, it was a little smaller, but Google's really been pushing it really hard. They have a team of people called the Gopher Team that travel to events and they manage the mailing list and they go do talks like this all the time. And they really drive. There's a mailing list where you can uh, subscribe to and get things. They have a Slack channel where they have channels for things like GoKit and App Engine and stuff like that. So you can talk right to the product management team at Google about App Engine and get questions or get invited to beta features very frequently. Um, there's IRC channels for a lot of things. Um, there's there's a, there's whole conferences around Go now where you can go and learn things. So it's it's really come along quite a bit. Google's really pushing the development and the progress of Go because they're using it internally for a lot of things uh, more and more and replacing some of their older stuff that was all C plus plus and Python and whatnot. And so. I've been really impressed with the community. The the guys that created it, Rob Pike and and um, and Ken Thompson and and those guys, really passionately believed in what they were building, and so they set out to to really evangelize it from the very even from the very early talks about Go, going back to when it was in its infancy. You know, they were very excited about it and. And pretty much, you know, very excited about bringing people into the fold. And so, the number of contributors to the Go source code base has grown quite a bit over time as well. It's an open source project, uh, and they've they've done quite a bit towards uh, encouraging people to submit fixes for things. And uh, so, I've been pretty impressed with it. Um, that was one thing we were worried about, and one of the reasons we talked about, like, well, maybe we'll just do this one thing in Go, was because, you know, how do you recruit Go developers? <laughs> you know, uh, there's there's more and more of them, I, I helped uh, create a Go meetup in Atlanta. Uh, there was one, and it kind of stopped. And so I created a new one. And then there was somebody else that had resurrected the old ones, so we sort of merged together. And so they meet every month over at uh, CodeGuard on Marietta and uh, talk about different subjects. And I presented, I presented about App Engine there before and service discovery and things like that. So there's a pretty eager learning community out there, people that are trying to do better and get better at it and things like that. And so I, I really have not gone back and done any PHP since I started writing Go. Uh, there were one or two times I had to help a friend fix something, and I'm just like, whoa, there's semicolons everywhere. And like, <laughs> put all these curly brackets, yeah. Um, since you are Mm -hmm. it, 
Well, it's not really a virtual machine. It's uh, you know, it's a standard Linux elf binary. I mean, go library runtime, plus the garbage collector, right? We um, yeah, we haven't done. I mean, well, we have a team at my company that's. Uh, their whole job is to be paranoid about exactly that topic, and so they've been getting their heads wrapped around Go. Uh, a lot of the static analysis tools we use for C++ and C and Java and .NET and whatever don't work for Go, and so they're trying to figure it out. A lot of the static analysis you would do with C++ doesn't even apply to Go, and so they're, they're working with our vendors to add Go to their library of things that are available, but we do, we do uh, penetration tests against all of our applications and uh, we're looking at for buffer issues and stuff like that so it is an issue I don't think you know that it would necessarily be good for super paranoid military spec kind of stuff um, but fortunately we're not in that business uh, yet so <laughs> um, but yeah it's right yeah, well, so up until Go 1.5, the Go runtime was actually written partially in Go and partly in C. And so you could use GEB with, um, with Go applications to a certain extent, um, but it would get confused about certain references into the Go runtime because it didn't understand the structures, right? Uh, with Go 1.5, the entire runtime is written in Go. And so there's a developer, I mean, a debugger that's been developed and is still actively sort of growing and becoming better called Delve, which is um, a Go debugger written in Go and it understands the Go runtime uh, completely. So it's actually quite a bit better than trying to jam GDB into it and compile it with certain flags. The whole relationship between C and Go uh, can be very confusing because, um, you know, just like with PHP, when you have extensions, you have a, a library like Rogue Wave or something that nobody had written a PHP extension for. Or like, you know, I created my own PHP extension around a C library that we wrote. Um, writing PHP extensions, you know, in C is uh, is is quite the mental exercise <laughs> because the documentation is like, you know, years out of date, or you know, it's really weird, like all these macros for Zend return and things like that. Uh, and so, but because of the ability to write PHP extensions based on any C library, um, that's why there are so many libraries for PHP. And so Go is the same way. We've had to wrap uh, tons of libraries in order to be able to use them in Go. But because of this thing called CGO, it was always really easy to do. You know, there's um, certain import statements and formats of comments and stuff you put in at the top of it that says, oh yeah, the build flag is, you know, dash L, blah, blah, blah. And then when it actually goes to compile and link the Go program into a static binary, uh, well, it doesn't produce a static binary anymore if you have UFC Go involved. Um, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, they, there's, um, there are some issues around this sort of security of doing that. Um, there, we try to actually take all those C libraries and compile them into static libraries and then link it all together statically so we still end up with static library, static binaries. Um, so would you say good practice would be to uh, go ahead and compile your third person dependencies before compiling the final? Yeah, I think so because the benefit of producing this static binary is that you, you know. You can run any Linux box, Ubuntu, Red Hat, whatever, uh, 6.7, 6.2. It generally doesn't matter very much at all. And so then if you're going to create something where you've called out to some C or C++ code and now that's, you know, an SO file, now you all of a sudden you've got to worry about the, you know, the Linux flavor again. And so it's much easier. We've recompiled a bunch of stuff as static just so we can link it all together statically. Yeah. Uh, so where I'm coming from, uh, like using Twig, mm -hmm. you know, Twig will handle both the same auto state things that we're talking about here, mm -hmm. but you know, to get back to Twig, you want to then embed that to another big template, uh, it's gonna try and double escape everything. There's oh, lots yeah. lots of tools you have to jump through to get around that. Gotcha. Um, so how does how to go avoid that problem or do you no, it does. It handles that for you. Uh, I never had to worry about double escaping things uh, with that. What happens is, um, I don't have a good example of that in the talk, but at the top of in a in the template definition, you can actually define it to have a name in the template itself, and not just in your reference in the Go code. And so then um, you would say 
uh, define, uh, and then you give it a name like left navigation or, or na navigation item or whatever it is. And then the other template that wants to like iterate over these things and use that template over and over again, it just uses that template by name. And so what it does is it actually pieces all those templates together and puts them together before it goes through and does all the escaping and, and replacement and stuff like that. So it's template templating Yeah, basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you pass data from the current template to the template? Uh, you, you can. It's a little tricky because uh, in the in the template it has this. Um, uh, where do you go? So it says range and then dot. So dot is the argument you're passing to the range, right? Now, once you go down into the range and you have the h3 tag, dot title is a dot at that point is the element in the range. So it's not the original item, and so. The, the dot originally is the lit, is the slice of items that each item has a property called author. And once you go into the range, now dot refers to that. And so you can get into situations where inside of that, the H3 block, you're calling a sub template and you want to pass it the whole item and not just that one row of it. And you can't. And so you have to structure things a certain way in order to be able to get to all that stuff. Or copy stuff into things you don't want to copy into, stuff like that. So it's um, it's one of those things where the Go templating stuff was sparsely documented at first, and people got confused about it. But it's improved quite a bit uh, over the time, and um, and it's really pretty powerful. Like a lot of tools, like Console, when you pass it, uh, and even Docker, when you do a Docker filter or a Docker inspect, that the reason why the argument to Docker inspect is this weird stuff with curly brackets in it is because it's taking that string you type and using it as a template. It's written in Go. So it's taking that and rendering the output using the template you typed in, uh, which is kind of crazy. But it also handles the fact that if you left out a curly bracket, it's like, sorry, I don't understand that. Yeah. So, uh, you were saying earlier that you moved from a PC model into the Go. Do you encounter any major like, barriers? Oh yeah, definitely tons. Uh, the the decision to migrate from sort of a monolithic application to a service oriented is uh, I could talk for another hour about that, but that's <laughs> you know that's not to be entered into lightly, really. I mean, a lot of people say now that really that transition should happen when you have maybe seventy five to one hundred engineers working on the same project, <laughs> uh, because. Because it does come with a huge penalty as far as the complexity of deployment, of testing. Uh, all those services now have to, they can't just blindly talk to each other without auth making sure they're authorized to. So you have to have an auth layer. Uh, typically, that's something like OAuth 2. Um, and so at everything at Disney, there was a centralized auth infrastructure where you would go and get, you would take the user, the guest credentials, and go there and get a bearer token, right? And that token would then be associated in the auth infrastructure with certain privileges and scopes. And then every service that, that was acting on behalf of that guest would take that bearer token and say, hey, create this cart item using this bearer token. And it would go back to the auth infrastructure and say, is that cool? Am I really allowed to do that? Can I create this item for this for this bear token? You know things like that. If you're going to do a service-oriented architecture, you have to have that security apparatus because otherwise, someone who gains access to one part of the infrastructure can forge requests, and none of the other services can verify that they're authentic. So that's just one of many things that sort of impact this service-oriented decision. And so th there's that huge cost to it. There's a huge amount of friction involved in. You know, once you've split two things apart, now you have to make sure, like, well, version 7 of this and version 12 of that aren't compatible anymore. So make sure you never deploy those to production together. <laughs> or, oh, we're going to run version 12 and 13 of this service at the same time. And then now you have to have a service discovery framework that can route traffic appropriately. It's a huge mess. And there are definite benefits to doing that. Um, it's just a matter of the benefits outweighing the you know, tremendous costs and the friction it can create. So uh, in some ways, I kind of wish we hadn't gone that way yet. <laughs> I mean, we have enough people that are you know, sort of justifiable. But the other thing, too, is um, performance of the application is hard to measure. Because now you say, well, it seems like service X is slowed down by 20% with this last release. Well, it's not necessarily service X's fault, right? Service Y might 
uh, have some other dependency, you know, maybe you updated it too. And so now you're trying to measure uh, performance changes in production. And it's like, whoa, gosh, like, well, what's been installed in production? Well, we installed, you know, new versions of these 27 different services. So who knows, <laughs> you know? And so now you have the instrumentation aspect, which is sort of where the middleware stuff comes in. Um, integrate Prometheus uh, libraries into your middleware. So it's capturing stats, you know, measuring histograms of the average response time to incoming posts to this URI. And so Prometheus can come by and scrape those out. And then, you know, then in your complex heterogeneous service-oriented environment, you go to your Prometheus dashboard and you say, okay, well, yeah, service X is slower, but it's making 30% more calls to service Y, which has not gotten any faster. So that's why it's slow, right? Or, yes, it's slower, it's making fewer calls to service Y, but those are getting slower and that's causing it. Or excessive errors on this other service, you know, the responses from service Y are so fast. Well, yes, they're all 500s, you know? <laughs> so it's, the context matters a lot. And so that's just one of many things that makes service-oriented architecture hard. But um, the great thing about writing all this stuff in Go is I'm working on actually shoving it all back into one binary because they were, <laughs> they were all constructed as basically libraries. And so you have a little short little main like this big that says, oh yeah, create a policy service or create a uh, authorization service and give it this uh, configuration from the environment. Okay, great. So all you have to do is create one main that says create one of these and one of those and one of those and one of those and run them all. <laughs> and uh, so now you have one thing, and so it, when it goes like service X says like I need to call service Y, it goes like I'm right here. And like <laughs> you know, there's no service discovery, there's no network communication, there's no TLS negotiation, there's no authorization step because you're making function calls instead of network calls. Um, you know, so it, it depends. It, um, it's a, it's a tricky uh, path to go down, and so um, you know. It, if you're going to start cutting stuff off and making it separate services, then there's a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. How do you manage, like, ah, I'm glad you brought that up. So um, one of the uh, engineers at SoundCloud at the time uh, realized that at SoundCloud they had hundreds of services, right? That, because they had all these different things, like encoders, decoders, uploaders, all this stuff. And they had some written in Scala, some Python, some Go, some PHP, some Ruby. It was all a crazy mixture. And they wanted to sort of get a hold of, like, say, like, going forward, we should all use this, right? Well, the Clojure guys started winning a lot of the arguments because they had this kit built around the JVM for, like, oh, uh, instrumentation of uh, something that runs in the JVM has been solved, like, five years ago, right? It's easy. Automatically give you stats on all the calls and all stuff. And Go didn't have that. And uh, so he, uh, Andrew Jaren, asked this P uh, guy, Peter, to give a talk at FOSDEM in London in January of this year. And he's like, what, are, what should I talk about? And Andrew's like, I don't know. Whatever's on your mind. And so this, this concept of like losing these arguments around the kit around Go was fresh in his mind. So he got up on stage and like, talked about this theoretical concept called Go Kit, which was a library kit that you could an enterprise developer could use that would provide you all these features that other people already had and in a sort of uniform way. Instrumentation, logging, uh, load balancing, things like that. And so GoKit has de uh, evolved quite a bit now to where there's client-side load balancing libraries you can use and so and retry policies, things like that. So you can say, um, how do I locate the discovery service? Well, I just call my load balancing library and it's been configured to use console or Zookeeper, or service records in DNS, you know, things like that. But your Go code doesn't care. It just says, hey, where's the discovery service, right? And so it gets this record. And then you can say, great, uh, I want to use a load balancing, a client-side load balancer to connect to the discovery service. And it takes care of the details of, should I fire off six requests at once and hope that one of them succeeds? Should I try one, then the other, then the other? Uh, should I keep trying the same one over and over again until it works? You know, it, it abstracts that away from your application logic. So your application just says, ask the discovery service where foo is, right? And somehow you get back this answer. And so it's not built into the Go standard library, but there's this other project called GoKit that's under active development and provides a lot of the same resources to you. And so I've actively been pushing that into our stuff as well. Uh, 
Asterix. It's no. Okay. Right, right. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've never used Hysterix, but the the idea of sort of static versus dynamic content is also present in some Go projects. Um, there's a CMS called Hugo, which allows you to sort of either pre-generate static, you know, HTML from using templates and stuff, uh, or run it in real time so it's constantly generating it all on the fly, and point them at each other so you can say, you know, this one just caches all this guy's stuff and, and you put it behind varnish and things like that. So some pretty powerful stuff around that. Okay, well, thanks for coming. Um, I'll be around for a little while if you have any more questions and great, thanks.